it's said that there are three secrets to making great landings. Unfortunately, nobody knows what they are. Now, that's an old joke, but fortunately, there is a proven way to make better landings, and that's by collecting data on your landings. And today, we'll talk with Chuck Kelly about how you can collect data for your landings and compare it with other pilots. Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation. My name is Max Trescott. I've been flying for 50 years, and I'm the author of several books and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. And my mission is to help you become the safest possible pilot. Last week, we talked about a fatal jet crash in Hot Springs, Virginia, and we had feedback from several airline pilots on the United Flight 2477 taxiway overrun in Houston. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 319. And if you're new to the show, well, welcome. But please, if you would, take a moment right now and touch either the subscribe key or if you're using the Apple Podcast app, the follow key, so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. And by the way, I'm recording this from a hotel right next to runways 25 left and right at the Los Angeles airport. So if you happen to hear any jet noise in the background, that's what it is. Also, let me remind you that this is a listener-supported show and that we have several ways that you can show your love and support for the show. If you would, take a moment, just go out to our new support page at aviationnewstalk.com slash support, and you'll find links to support the show via PayPal, Venmo, the Cash App, Zelle, and Patreon. And when you make a donation, I'll read your name on the show. Coming up in the news for the week of March 18th, 2024, pilots need to learn a new fuel color. A Delta Airlines pilot gets jail time, and a Colorado company wants to build the world's largest airplane to carry something really big, and we'll tell you what that is. All this and more, the news starts now. From generalaviationnews.com, Swift Fuels UL94 is now purple. Swift Fuels, which produces UL94 Avgas, announced that all shipments of its 94 octane unleaded gasoline will be dyed purple. Since its first delivery in April of 2015, the Avgas has had a clear transparent color, also known as water white. The color change, the result of more than four years of planning, is designed to help increase Avgas refueling safety in the marketplace by helping differentiate various fuel grades as well as water from one another. The new purple UL94 fuel is identical to the prior UL94 fuel in terms of quality and engine performance. It's just prettier. From avweb.com, Last week, the FAA announced the implementation of a new surface safety tool that warns air traffic controllers when an approaching aircraft is not lined up on its assigned runway. The FAA outlined plans to deploy Approach Runway Verification, or ARV, technology at several airports across the U.S. this year through 2025, with Austin's Bergstrom International becoming the latest to adopt the solution. According to the FAA, ARV, or ARV, is one of three surface situational awareness solutions under the agency's accelerated surface safety initiative. The other two components include the Runway Incursion Device, or RID, and the Surface Awareness Initiative, SAI. In addition to implementing new technology, the FAA is taking steps to improve safety through measures including hiring more air traffic controllers, installing upgraded tower simulator systems in facilities nationwide, conducting routine runway safety action team meetings, and investing millions into runway lighting and surface improvements at U.S. airports. From PaddleYourOwnCanoe.com, a veteran pilot for Delta Airlines has been jailed in the U.K. for 10 months after he pleaded guilty to reporting for duty as a pilot while being impaired through alcohol. Prosecutors accused him of showing a reckless disregard for the safety of his passengers and of putting hundreds of lives in danger. The long-serving pilot for the Atlanta-based carrier was due to fly a Boeing 767 with hundreds of passengers aboard from Edinburgh, Scotland, to New York's JFK aboard Delta Flight 209. The maximum penalty for anyone found guilty of being, quote, over the prescribed limit is a two-year jail sentence, though this pilot will likely only serve half of his sentence behind bars. The sentence is not unprecedented. In 2018, a Japan Airlines pilot was sentenced to 10 months in jail, for being over the prescribed limit before attempting to fly to Tokyo. From AOPA.org, Avidyne STC will upgrade Cirrus Integra panels. Cirrus owners whose aircraft are flying with Avidyne Integra avionics, that would be those aircraft built prior to 2009, will be able to upgrade their panels via an STC from Avidyne 
that the company said is in the final stages of consideration at the FAA. When approved, the STC for the Vantage 12 system will be available to some 4,000 aircraft in the fleet, and it comes as a kit that will be easy to install. The standard configuration includes two 12-inch displays, a single ADC or air data computer, a single magnetometer, audio panel, either an IFD 540 or 440 GPS NAVCOM, a DFC-90 digital autopilot, and a transponder. Avidine will be ready to deliver kits by the end of 2024. Retail price for the kit is in the range of $40,000. When trading in an existing core, the price does not include installation. From australianflying.com.au, fatal Cirrus crash resulted from go-around. The fatal crash of a Cirrus SR-22 at Bankstown Airport in March last year was the result of an attempted go-around, according to the ATSB. Cirrus Victor Hotel X-Ray Golf Romeo had just completed a bouncing landing on runway 11 center when the pilot elected to go around. Upon getting airborne, the aircraft rolled to the left in a nose-up attitude with the angle of bank reaching 90 degrees before colliding with the ground. The pilot was taken to a hospital in a critical condition but died from injuries three weeks later. According to the ATSB report, the aircraft was slower on touchdown then recommended in the Cirrus POH and sank onto the runway, causing the bounced landing that prompted the go-around. Other aircraft in the circuit reported a slight crosswind, but smooth conditions on final approach. On going around from the landing, the pilot was unable to counter the substantial torque effect associated with high engine power, low airspeed, and high pitch angle, resulting in loss of control and collision with terrain. And the article says the Cirrus Pilot Instructor course teaches that go-arounds should be done by, quote, immediately but smoothly applying full power as for takeoff, typically four to five seconds, connected right rudder due to significant left-turning tendencies and a possible strong pitch up. And I went and downloaded the report, and it says the pilot had recorded total flying experience of 860 hours, including 47 hours in the prior six months, and almost all of the total experience and recent experience was reported to be in the accident aircraft. A flight examiner recalled that over the course of two recent IPCs and associate practice flights, that the pilot's general flying, including circuits and landings, was unproblematic. Although those flights included a number of go-arounds that were safely executed, the flight examiner had discussed with the pilot the need to be cautious when applying power during go-arounds to ensure the aircraft remain easy to control. And a common mistake that I see when I fly with clients is that they will jam the throttle in at a go-around. It's really important to apply it slowly. The other key thing is that whenever you're moving your right hand forward, your right foot should be moving forward at the same time. I tell my clients that the right side of their body should be connected and that any time they're moving the throttle forward, such as takeoff or go-around, the right foot needs to be applied as well. From planeandpilotmag.com, the story of a Cessna 441 accident. This aircraft was flying the RNAV GPS runway 36 instrument approach at the Winchester Municipal Airport, KBGF in Tennessee. It started a descent but did not level out at the final approach fix altitude. Instead, it continued downward, crashing into woods about five miles short of the runway. Both pilots aboard were killed. The NTSB concluded the probable cause to be, quote, the pilot's failure to follow the published instrument approach procedure by prematurely descending the airplane below the final approach fix altitude to fly under low ceiling conditions, which resulted in controlled flight into terrain. It added, quote, the pilot likely attempted to fly the airplane under the weather to visually acquire the runway. And the author writes, this might not be as rare as we'd like to think. While staying at published altitudes is a basic safety rule for instrument flying, a 2020 Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University peer-reviewed research study found compliance approaching the runway to be remarkably poor. In fact, it says 96.4% of the 114 pilots descended below their stated personal minimums on a simulated ILS approach by an average of 300 feet, and about 82% descended below the published federal minimums by an average of 43 feet. The researchers noted, quote, these values are highly concerning. The authors concluded that pilots are knowingly or unknowingly accepting additional risk during a very critical phase of flight. And the author writes that the accident pilot had a possible motivation to descend below instrument altitudes. 
It mentioned a similar accident that occurred in Hibbing, Minnesota, that's K-H-I-B, in an accident that involved a Jetstream 3100 that said that for these aircraft, a technique had evolved among line pilots to minimize their exposure to icing condition. The NTSB report for that accident said the pilot's probable intention was to descend at higher than normal rates of speed to minimize time in icing conditions. That airplane quickly descended below the minimum altitude and crashed into woods four miles from the airport at about the same relative runway position as the Cessna 441. In both accidents, the pilots were trying to manage the threat of airframe icing in the clouds with anti-ice or de-ice equipment they didn't completely trust. They were trying to fly safely. And while minimizing time spent in cold, wet clouds is a valid general strategy, rapid descents inside the final approach fix is a dangerous practice. In both cases, no actual airframe icing was observed by investigators. And the author concludes, in trying to avoid icing, the pilots ignored basic instrument flying rules. Good pilots work hard to minimize threats, but sometimes risk management can be like holding too tightly to a balloon. Push hard enough in one place, and it blows out somewhere else. From FlightGlobal.com, the Honda jet landed fast and long in excessive crosswind before damaging excursion. U.S. investigators have disclosed that a Honda aircraft, HA-420, light executive jet, was traveling above reference speed and attempting to land in gust above crosswind limits when it suffered a damaging excursion at Houston's William Hobby Airport. The aircraft had a crosswind limit of 20 knots, partly owing to its low wing position and short landing gear which restrict bank angle during flare. It had departed Miami Executive for Houston with a pilot and five passengers on February 17th last year. According to the pilot's testimony, he made two requests to the Houston Approach Controller to use runway 31 left, but was instructed to use runway 4. When the jet crossed the threshold, it was traveling at 125 knots, above the reference speeds of 100 to 111 knots in the flight manual. It touched down around 2,000 feet from the threshold, initially tracking the runway center line but its left-hand weight-on-wheel sensor transitioned from ground to air about two seconds after touchdown. The aircraft had no wing-mounted speed brakes. The inquiry says a touchdown protection function to avoid inadvertent landing with a brake-locked wheel prevents power braking until weight-on-wheels is confirmed for three seconds. It is likely that the lack of positive weight-on-wheels parameters inhibited brake application, it says. The aircraft drifted left and veered off the runway at 75 knots, losing the outer part of its right wing and sustaining a landing gear collapse before coming to rest in the grass about 150 feet away from the runway. None of the occupants of the jet, November 1-4 Quebec Bravo, were injured. The inquiry says the pilot had 287 hours in type. And finally from avweb.com, massive aircraft designed to carry wind turbine blades. A Colorado company is planning to build the world's largest airplane. Radia, that's R-A-D-I-A, wants to build a 356-foot-long four-inch jet to carry wind turbine blades. This aircraft, called the Windrunner, would deliver the 320-foot blades to land-based wind farms. The aircraft will be designed to land on landing strips built in the wind farms, and the massive blades, which weigh 80,000 pounds, will be extracted and installed right from the aircraft. Each flight will carry two blades. The aerial delivery is necessary because the big blades can't be moved by truck or train. The turbines using the blades are said to be much more efficient than current turbines, which use blades that are 100 feet shorter and can barely be accommodated by the highway and railway systems. In terms of cargo volume, it's going to be seven times bigger than a C-5. And it shows a jet with four engines, but the manufacturer and the type are not included in the specifications. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates. And then we'll talk with Chuck Kelly about how you can use data to improve your landings. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And here's a quick update. I've been in Los Angeles this past week at the University of Southern California, once again taking some courses in their engineering department. This week, I've been taking the Aviation Human Factors course, and next week, I'll be taking their Helicopter Accident Investigation course, which includes a visit to the Robinson Helicopter Factory, which I'm really looking forward to. 
So I'm going to keep this short as my time is a little limited this week. But in next week's episode, 321, I'll plan to tell you more about the courses. And now let me tell you a little about Chuck Kelly. Chuck has been flying for 52 years. After a career in the aerospace industry, he owned a flight school at Palo Alto, which is where I used to fly about 30 years ago. He later went to work for Cirrus in a variety of jobs, including as a senior factory instructor and the regional training manager for the West Coast, South America, Europe, and fleet. He's currently the Dean of Flight Operations and Online Training for Copa University. And like me, he's a Platinum CSIP or Cirrus Standardized Instructor Pilot. And now here's our conversation with Chuck Kelly. Chuck, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Oh, Max, it's my pleasure. Good to see you again. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, before we jump into this, I know you've collected a lot of information about Cirrus pilots, but what about people who are not flying Cirrus aircraft? Can they apply the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about to their flying and their airplanes? Well, it really is a function of uh, a more modern panel. It doesn't have to be a Cirrus. You know, I know just about every manufacturer is now putting in some sort of glass, mostly Garmin. And I can tell you for sure, if it's Garmin glass, they can do this. All right. Super. That's great. Well, so you've collected some data that shows that Cirrus pilots on average could probably do a little better job of flying stable approaches. And when they don't, it sometimes turns into landing mishaps. Tell us how you got involved with this. Well, Max, after um, I retired from Cirrus, I, I became involved again with the uh, Cirrus Owners and Pilots Association. And that's a multi-level organization. And to, to keep it short, one of their arms is called the COPA Training Foundation, commonly known as the CPPP for COPA Pilot Proficiency Program. And it's, it's, it's within that organization that I started collecting all the data. So go ahead and explain uh, briefly just what is COPA, what is COPA University, what's a CPPP? COPA is, stands for the Cirrus Owners and Pilots Association. And uh, there's an arm of that organization called the COPA Training Foundation. It's a 501c3. And the goal is simply to collect as many pilots, not, you know, not necessarily Cirrus pilots. We cater to, to all pilots and help them understand what we see in the industry as the leading causes of accidents, there's plenty of data from many different sources. And we, we kind of are a data-driven organization, the, uh, the CPPP, as it were. And so as we look at the data, we change uh, or modify our programs, uh, including our flight instruction. All of our CPPP programs include uh, flight, instruction, uh, flight instruction as an option. And what does a typical uh, CPPP weekend look like if somebody signs up and goes? Well, it starts with a uh, Friday afternoon lunch. So we go from Friday afternoon to, to Sunday morning. Friday afternoon, everybody's invited to an opening lunch. There'll be a plenary session, and usually they'll see my smiling face in front of the room uh, with either Ed Waters or Mike Barnes. And we uh, will tell them what's coming for the weekend. After lunch, They've all got a schedule. There's always a big schedule printed. They have uh, on their iPhones a copy of the schedules, and they can select from avionics classes, maintenance classes, or what we call weather classes, which are part of our flight operations program, uh, and simulator training, as well as flight instruction, of course. And we do that Friday afternoon, all day Saturday, and we have a wonderful uh, evening dinner, very nice dinner with usually uh, a guest speaker. In a couple of weeks, we'll be having a CPPP in Knoxville, and uh, Travis Klum will be our guest speaker. So tell us about how you got interested in the serious landing accident data that we're going to be talking about. What brought that to your attention? Wow. Well, in early 2020, Copa University, we, we brought in a new uh, dean of aviation safety. He took over for Rick Beach, who I probably failed to mention earlier in our conversation, but Rick Beach is a well-known name in, in, the, uh, in the Cirrus world and in the safety world. And he, he's the guy that spearheaded and championed really looking deeply at the data. He's the guy that helped all of us um, become more aware of using CAPS and, and how to train how us CSIPs, how we CSIPs could train differently to help people become more aware of the Cirrus airframe parachute system. And when Mark took over for Rick, there had been a series of landing mishaps. And we started looking at those. And as you might remember, in 2020, ADSB was a thing. And when ADSB became a thing, so did 
the data source that was created by the AD, ADSB uh, signals. I'm not even sure what you call them, but that data source. So Mark was able to start piecing together from Flight Aware, Flight Radar 24, and, and ADSB sources what was going on with the airplane moments before a landing mishap. And what came shining through was airplanes with exceedingly high descent rates, higher than average, higher than POH or FOM standards, uh, airspeeds. And at that time, that was about all we had. But what we were able to, to determine was that there was never a landing mishap from what we would identify as a stabilized approach. And so that became very interesting to us. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Often people will say, yes, I know we should have stable approaches, but gosh, not all unstable approaches lead to landing mishaps. And that's true. I think people can often save many of them. But what you're saying is even more important, which is no landing mishaps occurred following a stable approach. That's very true. And we decided to create a whole course as an offshoot of, a, of a, a course that we had already, we were already teaching called Perfecting the Pattern. And we, uh, we kind of modified that course with this new data, Mark had. And at the time we delivered the first uh, presentation, it was, it was actually me giving that presentation. Uh, we had had over the last 10 months about 32 landing mishaps. And so I titled it 32 Reasons the traffic pattern matters. And it was an overwhelming success. And we've been creating new iterations of that as the data, as we get better handling the data over time. And we're very proud of, of that. So you mentioned one data source, which is ADSB. Tell us about the RDM is and how that helps you with information as well. So the remote data module is something that's been on Cirrus airplanes uh, almost since day one. It's a, a hardened module that can take a lot of G loads and is somewhat impervious to fire um, and is located in the tail of the airplane. What we noticed early on once we started collecting this data was that for some of the more serious accidents, even, even a couple of fatal accidents from go-arounds, um, the NTSB published the data from the RDM. And Mark was able to take that data and piece it together such that we could see what was going on with far more granular and uh, with better resolution, shall I say, all the way to the runway. And with that information, we were able to, to see how high sync rates and poor flaring techniques were the cause of, of most of these landing mishaps. And we, of course, in these, we, we got to see the, uh, the pitch attitudes and, you know, uh, unusual attitudes, really, that these airplanes found themselves in or these pilots found themselves in during a, a botched go around, let's call it. Yeah, so the RDM is going to have a lot more data. What I've seen with ADSB data is often it cuts off hundreds of feet above the runway, and so we don't get that data at the very, very end. Here it's collecting data continuously because it's not being sent through the airwaves to a receiver somewhere in the ground. It's being collected right there in the airplane. Now, how are you getting the RDM data? Is That's not for every flight, is it, or is it just for accident flights? Well, actually, we're not getting RDM data. I want to be clear about that. In, in our Garmin airplanes and even in our Avidyne airplanes, there is a SD card plugged into one of the, one of the glass panels. Uh, on, on the Garmin machines, it's the uh, MFD, top card MFD, and it's recording FDR, flight data recording. And that's, uh, there's somewhat less information in the FDR than there is in the RDM. So to be clear... Most of the data we, we use today and we see today is from the FDR, but it is, it's got all the engine data. It's got pitch, yaw, speed, G loading, lateral accelerations, uh, everything one needs to in, take a look at the data and figure out you know, what's going on. And if it's coming from a Garmin panel, it's second by second. So, yeah, I did want to be clear that the data we're going to talk about as, as you and I move through this discussion is mostly from the flight data recorder. Okay, great. So talk a little bit about flysto.net and how that's tied in with all the work that you and Mark have been doing. Well, I'm going to say coincidentally, because I'm never really sure when Flysto quite got together, but coincidentally, right around the same time, TBM was doing their work with their pilots 
Mark happened upon what we call Flysto. Flysto.net is a desktop application that you simply upload your FDR file, your flight data recorder file from your SD card to their site and click a button. And there it is in, in living color. You know, all the details of your flight from the engine data, CHTs, TITs, fuel flows, manifold pressures, RPM, to right down to the, the pitch attitude of your airplane on landing, Max. And these guys have been super partners with us at the uh, CPPP and Cirrus Pilots, frankly. I mean, over the years, uh, the months and the years since we've started using uh, Flystow, Many, many of the serious pilots that we come into contact with via the forums and who read our Copa magazines uh, have started using Flystow and uploading, uploading their data. And every day there's a new post on, uh, at least in, in our, uh, our Copa forums, about somebody else who just used Flystow and just can't believe how great it is. So I think that explains it. But if you have, if, if there's a question I created by answering your question, let me know. No, no, that's... <laughs> That's fine. So we were talking earlier about landing accidents and what percentage of the total of serious accidents are, are landing accidents. Talk about that a little bit. Why do we focus on landing accidents for Cirrus? Well, Mark Wydell, who I mentioned earlier, our Dean of Aviation Safety, keeps track of, of serious accidents and uh, general aviation accidents, but he filters out the serious accidents for us at the CPPP. And what you see when uh, when he publishes a chart is a big, huge bar with almost a – today you'd see a bar with about 120 landing mishaps. And then it would move down from cruise, approach, taxi, and miscellaneous other things that happened where the numbers are small. And so – never one to not look hanging – you know, the low-hanging fruit in the face. I said, Wow. I bet you we could save a lot of people a lot of insurance premiums if we could reduce the number of serious landing mishaps. And and look at we have this data that helps us kind of figure out what's going on. And I was intrigued because for years, Max, as flight instructors, we've been waving our hands, you know, fingers up, uh, palm down, landing, you know, your wing, and and it's just not working. And gosh, we've been doing this a long time, but if you look at more recent times with the pilot shortage and the number of flight instructors zooming off to the to the airlines, what we've got is kids teaching kids at the flight schools, you know, the, the universities and the ATPs of the world. Um, and there's not enough of us old guys around to, to give it more than a passing thought. They're just killing time and... I hate to admit it, but when I look at landing mishaps, I say, I think it's about time for a paradigm shift for us flight instructors on how we teach people to land. And now that we have the data in Flystow, it's, we can do that. And I'm, I'm very happy. I've always said that I think we're at a defining moment in, in aviation education. Yeah, I've always been fascinated when I look at the whole general aviation accident database and look at what phase of flight all the different accidents in. And certainly the, the landing phase has a lot of accidents, but with Cirrus aircraft, it's proportionally more. And I think part of the reason is we've probably eliminated a lot of the accidents from other phases of flight because of all of the systems in the aircraft. We're not having any CFIT accidents because people know exactly how high they are above the ground. People aren't running out of fuel very often because they've got great systems to tell them how much fuel they have. But the one area where we're still having challenges is with landings, which is why it's much higher percentage of all accidents than it is with uh, with other aircraft. Yeah, well said. So you ended up with something like 40,000 flight logs of Cirrus yeah. data. That's an impressive number. Tell me how that came about and how you're using that data today. Well, the word got out, Max, and people started uploading their data. And, and just to be clear, it's anonymous. You, if you upload the data from your flight or your client's flight today, nobody on the internet can find it unless your client or you choose to share it. So it, it's you know, you're, if you're worried about, you know, people spying on you, your insurance company spying, that, that's not what happens. You know, the evolution of this was I was the uh, chief CSIP at a uh, Southern California 
Sears Training Center for a couple of years, and we were operating a G6 SR20s. And so these airplanes were flying 500 hours a year. So I had thousands of flight logs, and I could have uh, instructor meetings, and I could, you know, take the the average of that data, and I can say, hey, guys, girls, people, we're doing really well here. We're not doing really well. Here. Let's think about when. You should trigger a go around if your if your client doesn't. Let's let's look at the thresholds beyond which you don't want to let them go. Not only because it's negative training, but because you're starting to get into the danger zone, right? And then I realized, well, if I've got this much data and it's just mine, what does Flystow have? So I contacted the people at Flystow, and I asked them if they could anonymize the data. Number one, and number two, trim it or filter it for just. 500 from 500 feet to the runway to turn it off the runway and about a week later i got this huge data file with just about 40,000 flight logs max uh, unbelievable and we were able to reduce it to f- for things like zero flap landings 50% flap landings 100 flap landings and it was when we started really looking hard at the data we got some very interesting results well so tell us those results. What did you find? So for those pilots that don't fly Cirruses or aren't familiar with Cirruses, but are familiar with standard operating procedures, the people flying Cirrus airplanes, since that's what we're talking about today, have a flight operations manual and a POH provided by Cirrus aircraft. And in those manuals are recommendations on airspeeds to fly for, you know, uh, and criteria to meet for stabilized approaches. Okay, while I won't go into every every individual criteria that they define, what we could fi- what we saw very clearly was from 500 feet to 50 feet, Cirrus pilots generally hit FOM POH recommended speeds at 500 feet, and again when we measured it at 50 feet. But what was happening in the middle was very interesting. And what we saw were average descent rates of 900 feet per minute. Now, most pilots try to fly about a three degree glide path, you know, uh, from 500 feet or so to the runway. And, you know, there's no way you need 900 feet per minute to achieve that at 80 knots in a Cirrus or any airplane for that matter. So what we realized was that they may be paying attention to speed, but energy management was not so good. The other thing we noticed, I don't know how far you want me to go into this, but when it came to stabilized approaches, we were able to say Cirrus pilots could do a lot better at managing their descent rates. And here's a few ways you can think about doing that. The other thing that we saw was a landing mishap doesn't really happen until the wheels touch the ground. So one of the questions was, well, when the wheels touch the ground, you know, what preceded it and was it within what we would call FOM specifications? And the Cirrus FOM says, like most like most GA airplanes, they would like to see the pilot touching down at or just above the stalling speed. Now, we kind of all know what the stalling speeds are for our airplanes at maximum gross weight. Hopefully, we're not all landing in airplanes at maximum gross weight. So, those stalling speeds are probably you know lower than book, but we're also in ground effect, which also helps to reduce by a couple of knots. And what we saw when the wheels touched the ground max was that the average Sears pilot was touching down at about 65 knots with a landing pitch attitude of just under five degrees. For reference, a Cirrus sitting on the ground, not moving, with all nose gear, struts, and pucks and things uh, to spec is roughly at two and a half to three degrees nose up. So touching down at just under five degrees means the nose wheel's barely off the ground. So from fly snow, we realized that pilots were spending only about five seconds in the flare. Now, five seconds in the flare was equating to five degrees or under of pitch attitude and 65 knots. So I said, I asked the question and I went out and did my own fly. And I said, well, how long does it take me to flare? And what are my pitch attitudes? And and Mark Waddell did the same in his airplane. And so what we came back with was my flare, the time and the flare that I am is 
I'm in is roughly seven or eight seconds. I'm touching down at about seven degrees nose up and about and just under 60 knots when I touch down. Now, I'm a bit obsessive about my landings and I like these nice nose high, full stall. You know, the, it looks like my hand kind of, you know, fingers up, heel down kind of thing. And so we did a little bit more work. I worked with some customers and I encouraged them to just hold the airplane off the runway a little bit longer. And what they discovered was these nice, you know, touchdowns. Sometimes it was a little kerplunk, but that was okay. And uh, they noticed that they could hold the stick back and the nose wheel would just kind of gently descend to the to the runway. And they were amazed by how quickly they could get off the runway and how little braking they had to do. Did I go too far? <laughs> so let me see. So speed actually matters, huh? Is that what you're telling us? <laughs> There you go. Speed matters and flaring matters. Yes. Let me go back to your uh, descent rate. You said that on average, they were descending at 900 feet per minute on the final. The thing about that is that means that half of those people were descending at more than 900 feet per minute. One of the criteria for Cirrus for a stable descent is you got to be less than a thousand feet per minute. So it sounds like what you're saying is almost half of those approaches were unstable because of the high descent rate. Yeah, uh, the first order standard deviation was plus or minus 300 feet per minute. So even the people who weren't, I mean, on the opposite end of the spectrum, they were still doing 600 feet per minute, which is almost twice as much as what you need on a three degree glide path at 80 knots. Hmm. Okay. And then um, what's the typical stall speed for, uh, for a Cirrus? Well, the, the maximum gross rate stall speed for a Cirrus is, uh, depending on CG, 60 or 61 knots. Yep. So if people are landing at 65, then they're at least four to five knots uh, above that. What kind of guidance can we give people in terms of what their reference speed should be if they're landing very light? You know, for example, let's say that you know, there's just me in the airplane and, you know, I've been flying for several hours, not a lot of gas. How would you tell folks to adjust that speed that they're using on, on final approach? Well, we're getting into interesting territory here, but we've done the math and I, I actually don't have a slide, but I can send it to you at, at a later date. And basically what we found is if you, if you run the numbers, you can reduce your final approach speed by about one knot for every 100 pounds under gross weight that you are. And that works for almost every airplane. While we're talking about Cirrus here, I would encourage people to hold their airplane into flare and understand what their landing weights is and calculate a, a reference speed for final approach. If Whether you're flying a Cessna 152 or a Vision Jet Max, I know the Vision Jet makes it pretty easy for you, actually. But in the 152s and 150s that we used to fly years ago, we had to do that thinking for ourselves. But we do do a weight and balance. So we know what our weight is before we take off. And we know the only thing that changes is our fuel burn. And, you know, at six pounds a gallon, the math's just not that hard. Yeah, totally. And I years ago read uh, something that the FAA had published in one of their safety bulletins. And they said, for aircraft that do not have landing speeds published at lower than max gross weight, you can use the following you know, rule of thumb. And they said, for Every uh, 10% you are low, a bit below the gross weight, you can reduce the landing speed by 5%. So basically, that's one rule of thumb. Sure. And I think it's going to come up pretty close to what you were just describing for Cirrus. But that's something that anybody can use in any airplane they fly. Yeah, yeah. I kind of, I'm thinking now that I should have been prepared with that formula so people don't think I'm just, you know, scratching on the back of an envelope somewhere. <laughs> but we, I can get it for you. Sure. So one of the things that occurred to me as we were talking is that the Cirrus is different in the sense that the pitch control, the side stick, is spring-loaded. And that's essentially the way Cirrus got around you know, having to you know, put gust locks in. If you look at Cessnas, for example, they have gust locks, and there have been a number of accidents over the years where people have taken off with a gust lock installed and have gotten killed. Cirrus avoided that problem because there is no gust lock. Nobody will ever take off in a Cirrus and get killed because they forgot to remove the gust lock. So the springs, 100%. the springs definitely solve that problem. And yet they introduce a bit of another problem, which is as we're pulling back in the flare, 
we need to pull back harder and harder and harder as we work more and more against those springs. Uh, do you find sometimes that people don't realize that they just need to add more force as they get uh, close to the, uh, the maximum pitch up? I do. I do. And I would add that Sirius has done a great job of positioning the pilot in the cockpit that the sight picture in a Cirrus is rather unique or it, and it's different for, for people transitioning. They, they all say the same thing. They have such a great view. And I think they like that view. And that's part of the problem. When you've got your 182 trimmed up, or I used to fly a lot of Bonanza A36s. When you got those trimmed up on final with your gear down and your flaps out, that instrument panel is, you know, you're looking out over the top of that instrument panel. And you know when you've got your aim point nailed because it's right there over the top of the, the you know, the glare shield. And, and you, you, But with, with the Cirrus, you have such a great view. I, I, I think people like that view. And they're like, ah, I think I'll hold it right here. And it turns out that that's not quite enough. And yes, I think a little bit more and constant back pressure would be, would be very helpful in holding it off. Just a couple more seconds, Max. Yeah, when I'm looking at the uh, side stick as people are pulling back, I find that most of the time when people are touching down, they probably have another three quarters of an inch, maybe an inch that they could go. And I'll often demonstrate that to people and say, hey, look, see, you can actually pull back even further. And I'll sometimes demonstrate this when we're sitting on the taxiway and we're not moving. You know, I'll tell them, hey, just pull it all the way back and see how much you have to pull at that far extreme. And I, I've never measured it, but I bet it's 20 pounds of pressure to get the last few degrees of pitch up. Probably, probably. Uh, you know, one of the tricks I used to use at the flight school before the, all my instructors caught on was I'd, I'd walk the flight line and I'd see where the elevators were because they're mostly right where they were when they finished landing. And I would know instantly whether they were trimmed for, you know, what we would call a normal final approach V ref speed. So, but then they caught on and uh, they started readjusting, retrimming after, after a landing. But then I, then I found fly still <laughs> caught him anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That works really well. Yeah. And I think your point about uh, the landings in, for example, a, a 172 or 182 is something that I remember a lot, which is we knew we had a good full stall landing when we got to the point where the nose was so high that it actually obscured the far end of the runway. And that was just kind of normal. We all knew that we were going to lose sight of the end of the runway for that last second or two as the nose got up as high as it you know, should be. And I think that so people are just not comfortable with that. They like to still be able to see down the runway, which may be part of the reason the noses aren't getting up as high as they could. Well, that that has been true forever, well before Cirrus airplanes were common. And um, something that we all, as flight instructors and aviation educators, try to to work with, because as you know, you know, if if you get them to the check ride and they're they're managing that pretty well, after the check ride, it's not gonna it's gonna decay a little, or you know. Well, and that's the thing I find in all aircraft is that. The first thing that decays as people get out of training is they're just not raising the nose as much as they should be. For whatever reason, uh, the farther people are away from their last uh, flight training exercise, the lower the nose seems to be as they land. Yep, which is a great segue, if you will, Max, because part of the program uh, that we teach is 32 Reasons Why the Traffic Pattern Matters. And, and what I like to tell everybody is... We basically learned how to fly in the pattern. When you think about learning to fly, you, you go off to the practice area, do some maneuvers, some, some slow flight and things. But then you come back and you work on the goal of every pilot, nailing a great landing. And the problem is we did a lot of touch and goes. And I'm not really dissing touch and goes. But, but the problem is we used the pattern as a conduit to get us to the final so we could practice another landing in instead of using it as a crucible to nail our speeds, our altitudes, our headings, and our, our airplane control, and especially trim after each configuration change. And so we as instructors allowed that to happen. You've been there. I've been there, you know, at the end of a long Saturday or Sunday, and you save the day. And we save the day far too many times when we should have been probably saying go around. Okay, I'm not going to let you let the wheels of this airplane touch a runway until you can hit these gates on upwind, crosswind, downwind, 
base and final. And when you got that good, I'm still going to tell you to go around because I can. And by the time they actually start landing, it's almost a non-event. And I wish I had known that back in the 80s when I got my instructor rating. And, and I wish I, would, I could get to more instructors today to help them think about landing that way. So what you're saying, I think, in essence, is that instructors tend to focus on the final segment, but they're not forcing their clients to meet the altitudes and speeds that they need at every other point around the pattern? I guess forcing is the right word. Yeah, I think demanding that sort of perfection sets a lot of good examples and a lot of good goals. Whereas kind of letting them bomb around the pattern, you know, fixing it on upwind, fixing it, whether it's altitude or heading or wind correction or speed, and just kind of fixing it all the way around just gets them on final still fixing, right? And when you get the higher wing loaded airplanes, and, and most people who continue to fly usually fly faster, heavier airplanes. And as the wing loading goes up, these things get even more important. So, yeah. You know, one other thing you mentioned was uh, touch and goes. In my club, they don't allow us to do touch and goes in aircraft that have 200 horsepower or more, which means when I'm teaching a student pilot in an SR-20, we're not allowed to do touch and goes. And I think that's actually been a good thing. I think that when people are doing touch and goes, there's probably a tendency to to rush the transition from landing to takeoff, which means they're probably not getting the nose up as high as they should, or they might not be holding it there as long as they should, because now they're anxious to lower the nose at full power and start uh, going around. What, what do you think about kind of the value of touch and goes versus full stop landings? Well, I'm pretty much with you and your club, and I think they were wise, especially um, as I as I recall, you you were working out of Palo Alto where the runway is only 2,450 feet long anyway. So, you know, you have to be on your game all the time, even in a, even in a slower airplane, but in, a, in an airplane with 200 horsepower, for sure. My feeling on touch and goes is it becomes about money and it becomes all about the number of landings somebody can get in in a period of time. And you are always get arguments both ways, but here's the thing, okay? If what the instructor is doing has a, if the instructor has a plan, like I was explaining before, hit your gates, you know, manage your wind correction, get your speeds, do your do your configurations, then I'm okay with a full stop taxi back. I'm okay with a stop and go if the runway is long enough. I'm okay with uh, adding a uh, go around in there and then a touch and go. So if every fourth landing is a touch and go, I'm okay with that. If you're doing instrument training and you want to do a touch and go from an instrument approach, I'm okay with that too, because you're not doing them all the time. But as a general rule, using the touch and go as a means to accelerate learning to land, I just think you're kind of embedding negative learning. Yeah. And so I guess as I think about it kind of on a continuum, when someone is first starting to land, that's when I think touch and goes are probably the least value. uh, Because I find that that time where you're taxiing back, it's great time for those early students to kind of recoup, kind of regroup, and to hear our discussion about exactly what happened on each landing. When you're doing touch and goes, wow, there's not much time to go. Well, you know, you flared a little on the high side, and then we drifted a little bit to the left. And, you know, besides, you've probably forgotten half of those things by the time you're at 100 feet above the ground anyway. But as someone becomes more experienced, they're far down in their flight training then I can see that uh, it it might make more sense because you're not going to give as much feedback at that point because they did pretty darn good job of landing. Yeah, and think about it like this: with the uh, most of the data in your, if you're flying a Garmin panel like you see in Cessnas, I mean, I remember the first 2004, 2005 uh, flying back uh, in a new glass panel Cessna, and it's like whoa. You know, and if it wasn't for you writing books, most of us would still be guessing on what to do next. But I never, I have meant to thank you on that. That your books made a huge difference in the industry, and I, and I think, uh, I don't think enough people tell you that. So good, good on you. But if you have the ability to download that data or upload that data and take a look at it, the power of that debrief. Okay, especially when it correlates so closely to what you were saying as the student was taxiing back. I often used to taxi the airplane back myself. 
just so the student had all the bandwidth to listen to what I had to say. Generally, I could keep it on the center line and talk at the same time. So, and now with the power of uh, post post flight debriefing with this kind of data, even if you pull the card from the airplane, take it in and put it, plug it in your computer. If you're a Garmin Pilot fl- fan. You can literally connect the Garmin Pilot through, I think, Flightstream, either 210 or 510, one of those 10s, and your Garmin Pilot will record that data. So you, you can eliminate the step of actually having to pull the card out of, out of the MFD. Hmm. Powerful debriefing. Yeah, and I just want to mention real briefly, you mentioned stop and goes. I think that those are awesome, and people just don't do those often enough. If you've got a nice long runway and you don't have a particularly busy pattern, yeah, why not go ahead and do the full landing to a full stop so you're not cutting any corners, talk for a few moments about what just happened, reconfigure the airplane, add power and go. So I absolutely love uh, stop and goes. But let me ask you about what Cirrus pilots can do to compare their data with other data. Are they able to do that or are they only able to look at their data that they flew for the flights that they've uploaded? Great question. Great question. Well, if you're using Flystow, and I don't know what all the other, and there's several other products out there. I mean, Flystow is not the only one. There's Cloud Ahoy for sure. Uh, ForeFlight does some stuff. But with Flystow, you not only see what you did, but Flystow tells you what the average fleet is doing. So they know you're a Cirrus in this case, and they literally publish what the, your years relative to the fleet. And I can tell you, I've seen those numbers, and you generally don't want to be doing what the fleet's doing. <laughs> I think that's a good goal. You probably <laughs> want, in general, to be a better pilot than the average pilot. 100%, Max, 100%. <laughs> Yep, that's great. We should all hold ourselves to uh, very high standards when we fly. So it sounds like if somebody wants to participate in this program, they essentially go to flystow.net and upload their data from the SD card that they pull from their Garmin. Is that basically it or is there more they need to do? Well, there's a registering, you know, creating an account. It's, It's free for now. I don't know how long it stays that way, but they've uh, they've invested a ton of time and money to get it where it is. I'm sure they're going to want to monetize it somehow, but they're really they're very reasonable people. They're, they they the the software engineers all live in Europe, primarily Germany, I think, and I've I've t- I talk with uh, several of them once a month to see what's new. So yeah, register and upload, and poof, there it is for you. And it takes you know I would tell people give it. 30 to 60 minutes of playing around, touching buttons, seeing what you do. Cause you can, you know, you can compare. I, I like to throw up uh, on their charts. I like to throw up manifold pressure, uh, fuel flows, indicated airspeed, pitch attitudes, just to kind of take a look at energy management, I guess. And it's really cool. You can see where the pilot for whatever reason, brought the throttle back to idle because somehow they think that controls airspeed and forgot to put it back up. And suddenly the sync rates, (laughs) the sync rates go down and then you see the engine surge and, you know, you realize this is where, you know, the bell should be going off in their head, go around. And when you can show them that, right there uh, uh, on their computer, I think it really cements the idea that they're not learning to fly with their instructor next to them anymore, where they they were always allowed to fix the approach all the way down to the runway. And at some point you have to decide when is it time to stop fixing and break it off. And it's right there for you in, in living color, actually. Now, I think there's probably at least somebody out there who, when you said you don't control airspeed with throttle, who went, really? That's the way I yeah. do it. And I think I that a lot of people, when they you know, learn to fly, in uh, a trainer such as Cessna or many of the other trainers, they have a lot of drag. And yeah, you probably can go through life uh, just using throttle control airspeed. But yeah. tell us what you do in the Cirrus to control airspeed, because it's a slippery airplane and you probably use a different technique. Well, uh, in the, in any Fiki airplane with Garmin perspective in it, there's also an angle of attack indicator. Now you're going to get me in get me to go down one of my other favorite subjects. I would use angle of attack. 
And I don't really have to worry about what my landing weight is because my angle of attack is always going to be the same and let the airspeed go where it goes. Um, but I manage airspeed with pitch and I manage my descent rate to my aim point with power. Bravo. <laughs> yeah, I, I do that. I could tell you a long story, but I'm not sure we have the time for it. But um, I did have the opportunity to meet the author of Stick and Rudder, Wolfgang Langevisha, uh, lived in Winters, California back in the uh, 80s. William, his son, was uh, a flight instructor where I was getting my ratings, and I, I, I used William a lot, and we became good friends. And uh, I would fly to Winters, and what his dad told me in broken German, broken English, actually, was, you can ask a thousand pilots what they're doing, okay? And they might all tell you something different, but when you watch what they're doing with their hands, it's all the same. So, so long as they're on the front side of the power curve. I mean, I talked with a, a good friend of mine who's a platinum CSIP yesterday who told me he manages speed with his power. Hmm. And I just let it go. I did convert him to AOA, but I, and I'm not sure how he makes the AOA work doing it that way, but he's a good guy. And my experience has been, yes, you absolutely can control the speed with the throttle. But what I find is people control it much more tightly if they're using tiny changes in pitch. You know, they can fly the airspeed plus and minus one knot. And I'm not kidding. I mean, you really can do it that precisely. If you're doing it with the, the throttle, yeah, you're probably controlling it, you know, plus and minus two, three, you know, knots or more. Yeah. Well, there's that delay, right? There's, I mean, there's just a delay between, I mean, even with a propeller, which is almost instant thrust, there's a, there's a bit of a delay. And there's also, you know, what I call the inverse of power on trim, right? If you add a little bit of power, a little more prop wash over the tail, airplane's literally going to slow down unless you do something else. So I don't know. You're going to get a lot of comments, I think, from, <laughs> from this part of our conversation. Well, Chuck, as we wrap things up here, any final thoughts or comments? Yeah, I think my final thought and comment would be to flight instructors who listen to this. And while Max and I can talk about using how we, how we control airspeed, I think the greater good that you can do is taking advantage, if you have the opportunity of the modern technology in your airplane, to download some of this data. I know that everybody I've converted, every flight instructor that I've shown this stuff kind of kafad, you know, oh, yeah, one more thing to do. But after they look at it, uh, and I'll tell you, our instructors at the CPPP are all doing it now, and they can show their clients exactly, this is what we talk about in the classes, this is what I asked you to do in the airplane, and here you have it now right here on your computer. You, you did it, and, it and, and, and you can take this home, and you can, you know, and you can take it to the bank. And your insurance premiums may even go down. Uh, I, so I would say, as a flight instructor, Give it a chance if you have the opportunity. Think about some of the things Max and I talked about today. We're between the two of us. We've got uh, a lot of years and uh, of teaching and flying together, and we've known each other for like thirty years. Max and I met at a flight school I used to run in Palo Alto. And if you're not a flight instructor, but you're trying to be the, you know, how do I want to say it? I mean, the, the landing has always been the, the tail of the pilot, right? Nail the landing. You're a, you're a hero. You're a god, right? So if that if you want to be a god, you know, pay attention to some of the some of the newer things you can do to get better at at managing your airplane. Because here's the here's the thing I have found with all everyone who has used Flysto for the first time, and I'll leave you with this: they are astounded, Max, at how different the data is from what they thought they were doing. No question. You want to have all your decisions driven by the data. And fortunately, we have lots of data to do that. Where do people go to find out more about COPA and perhaps about your work? Well, that's a that's a good question. First of all, for, yeah, I would, uh, you know, Google uh, Cirrus Owners and Pilots Association. You'll get a lot of information there. The Cirrus Pilot Proficiency Program is well explained on the CirrusPilots.org website. I'll say that again, CirrusPilots.org website. Uh, if, if you're interested in the pilot proficiency program, pilots from technically advanced airplanes of all types are welcome. We don't talk a lot about airplanes that aren't technically advanced anymore. Sorry about that. But, uh, you know, when it comes to stick and rudder skills and the things we use Flysto for, you don't have to have a technically advanced airplane. And uh, I think that would be a good start right there. And of course, they can 
I don't know if you'll have my email address uh, in your show notes, but you're welcome to put it there and uh, they can email me. That's great. Chuck, thanks so much for joining us here today. It's been my pleasure, Max. It's good to see you again. Keep up the good work. And my thanks to Chuck for joining us here today. If you'd like to contact him, you can reach him via his email address at cfichuck at me.com. And just a reminder that I love hearing from you and I read many of your emails on the show. If you'd like to send me a message, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page. That's absolutely the best way to send me a message. And of course, I also want to thank everyone who supports the show in one of the following ways. We love it when you join the club and sign up at aviationnewstalk.com slash support to support the show financially. You can also do that at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. We also love it when you leave a five-star review on whatever app that you're listening to us on now. And of course, if you're in the market for a headset, please consider buying a Lightspeed headset and using one of the links in our show notes, because if you use those links, they will donate to help support the show. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. And remember that you can always go around. You can-